Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gabby Robel, and I'm the Vice President of NOW, National Organization for Women here on campus. So thank you for joining us today, today at the University Hour. Much thanks to the President's Office of Equity and Diversity and the Women's Center for making this talk possible. The first female government of Connecticut, Ella T. Grasso, once said, it is not enough to profess faith in a democratic process. We must do something about it. Grasso's words summon us to action, to speak, and to be involved. Today, it is my honor to introduce to you all two high court officials, Chief Justice Chase D. Rogers and the Honorable Judge Maria Khan. Today's conversation allows us to build a better understanding about justice and one's access to justice. What can you and I and our communities begin doing to ensure everyone has equal access? In addition, we'll hear about the judges' experiences, their life, legacy, and so forth. So Chief Justice Rogers is a Connecticut native Chief Justice Chase Rogers has been the Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court since 2007. Prior to that, she served as a judge in the Connecticut Appellate Court from 2006 to 2007, and as a judge in the Connecticut Supreme Court from 1998 to 2006. Prior to becoming a judge, she was a partner at Cummings and Lockwood in Stamford, Connecticut, where she focused on employment law and commercial lit litigation. Chief Justice Rogers is a member of the Board of Directors of the Conference of Chief, Chief Justices and of the Connecticut Bar Foundation Nominating Committee. She received her JD from Boston University School of Law and received her BA from Stanford University. Um, Judge Maria Khan was born and raised in Angola, Africa and emigrated to the US at the age of 10 and a half. She learned English in the US and is fluent in Portuguese and Spanish. Judge Khan graduated from New York University with a BA in politics in 1986 and earned her Juris Doctor from Fordham University School of Law in 1989. She's admitted, she is admitted to the following bars, United States Supreme Court, United States Federal District Court for the District of Connecticut, United States Court of Appeals Second Circuit and the Connecticut and New York State Bars. Judge Khan was appointed a Supreme Court judge in 2006 and currently is assigned to her criminal matters in a Fairfield Judicial District Courthouse. So welcome Chief Justice Rogers and Judge Khan and thank you for joining us for University Hour. Thank you and uh, good afternoon everybody. Um, we're gonna try and keep this uh, hopefully interesting, uh, relatively interesting for you. So we're each gonna speak just for a few minutes uh, and then we're gonna go to a Q&A and uh, try and answer the questions that you all have, uh, have uh, expressed some interest in. Um, I thought that I would focus for a few minutes uh, on the history of women in the courts uh, and then talk more broadly about access uh, to justice in the courts and particularly in Connecticut and what we've been trying to do to improve access. Um, let me start that in 1638, Margaret Brent, the first woman lawyer um, in America, arrived in the colony of Maryland where she was involved in more than 100 cases in the colony and also in Virginia. Um, then we had a minor setback. You fast forward to 1860 mm -hmm. when Myra Bradwell of Chicago filed an application for a law license with the Illinois Supreme Court. Uh, the justices promptly denied her application, the reason given, quote, the disability imposed by your married state end quote. We suffered another setback uh, a few years later when the Wisconsin Supreme Court rejected the application to practice law by Lavinia Goodell. And the court determined that, and I quote, um, it's quite beautifully written, even though it's quite incorrect, um, nature has tempered women as little for the judicial conflicts of the courtroom as for the physical conflicts of the battlefield. Woman is modeled for gentler and better things. Discussions are habitually necessary in courts of justice, which are unfit for female ears. The habitual presence of women at these would tend to relax the public sense of decency and propriety. So fortunately, we have made some uh, progress since back then, and I don't think that the Wisconsin bench of 1874 would know what to make of the Connecticut bench of 2014. Um, as we stand here today, there are three women on the Connecticut Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the Court of Last Resort. There are uh, the Chief Judge of the Intermediate Appellate Court is Judge uh, Alexandra de Pantima. And in the trenches at the Superior Court, we have 55 women and 106 men serving as Superior Court judges currently. So while we're making progress, um, I do think that we need to be focused on the broader picture, and I'm not sure that there's ever been a more critical time than right now to focus on diversity and what we can do to improve it in our courts, which are, 
as we all know, being called upon to resolve matters in a fair and neutral way. So it's important doing, in doing so that our judiciary set an example, both individually and as an organization. Um, as individual judges, we take very seriously our oath and we understand that we cannot and do not base our opinions on gender, race, religion, ethnicity, culture, disability, sexual orientation, or frankly, the amount of money that someone has to pay a lawyer to represent themselves. The branch as an organization also has to respond to the challenge if we're going to make a difference. And there is, of course, the obvious. The judicial branch um, has policies and procedures in place that encourage equal opportunity and strictly prohibit, uh, prohibit unlawful discriminatory acts. Um, I can tell you, and we're quite proud of this, that of all the branches of government, um, our diversity is the best of any of the branches, and that, would, that includes the executive and the legislative branch in terms of numbers and percentages. In addition to the written rules, though, that um, encourage diversity, we also have to continue to work towards enhancing a culture of diversity. And for this reason, we've specifically incorporated a culture of diversity into the branch's strategic plan, which is the plan that we operate under, to strive to provide a diverse and culturally competent environment that's sensitive to the values and responsive to the needs of those who interact with the judicial branch. And in this regard, we've developed for our staff um, a comprehensive training program. I believe it's a several-day program uh, in dealing with people who come to the courts who may be different from the staff that are interacting with them so that they can appreciate and understand and work with them to uh, make sure that they are finding the resources that they need. Um, I now want to turn just very briefly uh, to access to justice. Um, and we have to do this uh, because we need to ensure that there's an even playing field for all the parties that appear before us so that justice can ultimately be achieved. And I can assure you that the branch takes that obligation very seriously. Um, and specifically, we focused on several areas where access to justice is the most at jeopardy. So I'm just going to briefly run through two of those, and then um, Judge Khan is going to talk about the remaining one. Um, we've been working really hard to help self-represented parties to make sure that they have the tools that they need to have meaningful access when they can't afford an attorney. Um, I will tell you, and we may talk about this a little more in the questions, that you really are in a weaker position when you don't have a lawyer representing you because the system has been set up for a judge and two legal advocates who are representing the parties. So when somebody comes in and tries to represent, them, to represent themselves, it's difficult. We've done what we can to make it at least fairer. And in that regard, we currently have up and running 10 volunteer attorney programs, which um, these are lawyers who volunteer and help people who don't have uh, counsel in cases involving family matters, foreclosure matters, and small claims matters. And as of the end of January uh, of this year, more than 5,000 self-represented people have had the help of lawyers on a pro bono basis, so they're not having to pay them regarding these matters. We've also uh, been working over the last five to six years to simplify all the legal forms that people have to fill out. Um, if you have ever seen one, um, they used to be quite complicated and even the lawyers had trouble filling them out. So we've tried to put them in as plain a Engli a English as possible. Um, we also have court service centers and these have been very helpful. What they are is we've got 25 of them. Um, in 2013, more than 230,000, that's a large number of self-represented people, were assisted by judicial branch employees who staff these centers. And what they do is they provide the public with, among other things, computer and internet access, printers, forms, and pr probably most importantly, one-on-one -on -one insistence on as to, for instance, how to fill out various forms um, depending upon the matter that the person is involved in. Finally, what we've done is we've created a pro bono committee um, so we can increase representation for people who can't afford a lawyer. And that was one of the first major initiatives that the pro bono committee undertook was to organize the state's first ever pro bono summit held at the legislative office building in Hartford. Um, what we asked were the, some of the largest corporations in Connecticut to come. We asked some of the uh, top law firms to come. We had the governor there and we had a discussion about what are we going to do? There are too many people who do not have lawyers. 
So as part of this effort, a, a catalog came out that provided all the pro bono opportunities in Connecticut because what we were hearing from lawyers is that they wanted to help, but they didn't know where to go to do so. So now they have a very clear um, guide. And some of the areas that uh, lawyers are helping people in um, include uh, helping veterans, helping victims of domestic violence, and helping children. Um, and it's been a very successful um, program. So with that, what I'm going to do is turn it over uh, to Judge Khan, who's going to speak for just a few minutes about another area of access that we worry about, and that's for people with limit, limited English proficiency. Um, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Um, I guess it's on. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me. I want to thank you for inviting me. I want to thank the Chief Justice for inviting me to join you here today uh, to address the issue of limited English proficiency. So uh, the Chief Justice, uh, after, shortly after her appointment, began appointed the Public Service and Trust Commission to study the courts and to make sure that Connecticut courts were uh, accessible to all and to uh, studies, study ways in which the courts could improve. And she talked uh, about some of those efforts and what has resulted in that. Uh, she also uh, created a strategic plan to accomplish that goal. One of the subcommittees that's part of the strategic plan is the Limited English Proficiency Committee. Um, and I uh, was fortunate to be appointed by the Chief Justice to co-chair that with uh, some uh, folks at the uh, court operations judicial branch. Our committee uh, had members not only who worked for the judicial branch, but also representatives from the various uh, communities. Uh, certainly the Hispanic community because Spanish is the most requested language, uh, but also Portuguese and Polish. And our committee uh, created several subcommittees, which included a committee to do community outreach, uh, to uh, conduct both surveys internally within the branch and outside of the branch to the organizations that serve limited English proficient individuals. By the way, limited English proficient individuals are individuals who, for whom English uh, is not their native language and uh, they cannot effectively express themselves either orally or in writing uh, in English. Uh, and so our committee did a lot of work we came up with a series of recommendations to the Chief Justice, and she approved those recommendations and tasked not only our committee, but divisions within the branch to implement them. And I'm proud to say that Connecticut received recognition uh, nationally for its work in the area of LEP. Um, some of the things that we uh, accomplished were we uh, created a, a language access plan, which provides for both interpretation and translation services to any LEP individual who uh, accesses uh, the courthouses, not just for in-court proceedings, but also out-of-court proceedings. We created a web page uh, which uh, gives individuals who are limited English proficient notice of the services we provide. And that web page has been translated into both Spanish, Polish, and Portuguese which again are the most requested languages. We also embarked on an effort to translate the most uh, vital forms or the most requested forms uh, that litigants use, both civil, criminal, family, and all the areas within the branch. Um, and those are available online. Uh, it's user friendly, so if you go onto our website, uh, there is a link on the left-hand side for limited English proficiency, and it is both uh, there's also an easy link to both the Spanish, Polish, and Portuguese page. Uh, obviously, I have a vested interest. I'm fluent in both Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, also on our LEP <coughs> committee were uh, members of the Hispanic Bar Association and other community stakeholders. Um, the uh, Connecticut uh, LEP, the work of the Connecticut LEP committee along with all the work that has been done by the Chief Justice and the strategic plan uh, was recognized by the National uh, Center for State Courts 
and we were asked to present about that at a national conference, a national summit on language access to the courts. So for me, it's really a pleasure to serve on this committee, and I, I thank the Chief Justice for uh, including me and appointing me to the committee. I encourage you to look at our website and to see the extensive services uh, that we provide for the uh, limited English uh, proficient uh, community. So thank you. And um, opportunity. yes, do you want me to do that? Yeah. Uh, also, we wanted to share with you that there are many opportunities for you to work within the branch. So uh, hopefully you, you have a sense of just one of the committees uh, that uh, the Chief Justice uh, created as part of an overall strategic plan. There are many others. And within the branch, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, some uh, folks, both lawyers and non-lawyers, who are incredibly talented, creative individuals. Uh, and we work on some very exciting projects, like remote interpreting, uh, a tape recorded advisement of rights for, uh, to maximize our services. Uh, we work on instructional videos for individuals who are self-represented uh, or limited English proficient. And we wanted to tell you that there are opportunities for you as both college students and then hopefully as graduates to consider a career uh, within the judicial branch. If you go on our website, uh, there is a link for internships and externships. Uh, while you're doing your studies, I encourage you to go on that website and to look and to apply uh, because I think uh, you will find those opportunities to be exciting uh, and hopefully open your, I don't know how many of you are interested in law or, uh, or the justice system, but I encourage you to pursue those opportunities. They frequently lead to jobs and careers. And I, I just would add, I mean, we're a fairly large employer. There are 5,000 employees uh, that I'm ultimately responsible for in a number of different areas, whether it's uh, data entry, um, interpretation, uh, clerks, um, external affairs, so press coverage, a number of different things. So you may want to go on the website and take a look and see what opportunities are available. So I think with that, you had some questions for us? So now we're going to begin our Q&A session. Um, the first question is, how did you become interested in politics? Um, well, I, would, I, I was a political science major in college, and then I didn't think about politics for the next uh, 15 years when I was uh, going to law school and then practicing uh, as an attorney. Um, we're really not political in the sense, I want to make sure everybody understands this, we're not elected. Uh, we don't decide policy. We're really there just to make sure that the law, as the legislature decides it should be, is then applied correctly, whether it's with a criminal defendant or in a uh, commercial uh, dispute. So we're not really political in that sense. Um, but I will tell you that as Chief Justice, the second part of my job, aside from deciding cases, is working uh, with the legislature and with the governor to make sure that we have adequate funding uh, and that things aren't imposed on us that shouldn't be imposed on us. So in that sense, it's political. So um, I guess in one way it has become a political uh, job for me. I would um, echo some of uh, the Chief Justice's remarks. I too majored in political science and uh, had a minor in French, but did go directly to law school. And I pretty much my entire career have been involved in public service in one form or another. Uh, but not really involved in politics uh, as such, so. Um, what did your parents teach you about justice and what influence, if any, do their teachings and upbringings have on your personal perspectives of justice? Well, my parents were a great influence on me, not because of uh, what they could um, advise. Neither one of my parents had more than a high school e uh, education. I immigrated to the United States at the age of 10 and a half, and my parents worked in a factory. But what they did stress was education um, and hard work. And so I thank my parents for uh, that great influence they had on me and my brother 
which was to focus on our studies, to work really hard. Um, and so in that sense, they were a great um, support and influence. And also their sense of, of justice and to uh, you know, do what's right. OK. Um, well, I think that in terms of justice, in terms of how I perform my job as a, a judge, probably my parents' greatest influence is my parents are opposites. You could not be more opposite. Uh, it's, I come from a mixed religion family. I come from a very staunch Democrat and a very staunch Republican. And I used to sit in the middle and listen to them. So um, I think that what I really gain from them is um, you need to really listen to the whole story and then evaluate and make up your mo own mind as to what you think. Uh, and that's very important because um, it's really probably the most important thing that a judge do has to do is not prejudge a situation. They really need to be able to listen and uh, decide what the facts actually are. So that's, I would say that was their biggest influence on me. What barriers did you have to smash through to gain the experiences and opportunities that you have today? Sure. Um, I, um, I'm, again, I'm very fortunate. I, as I mentioned, immigrated. I was 10 and a half years old. I did not speak English. I only spoke Portuguese. Um, and so, and because my parents did not speak English, uh, in fact, uh, their English. My mother's is quite good now. My father doesn't speak English, and I pretty much speak with them only in Portuguese. Um, they couldn't really help me with schoolwork or tell me what schools I should be looking at or uh, what opportunities I should uh, focus on. Uh, but the barriers I, I faced were language barrier, not speaking the language, not growing up in the culture, understanding uh, certain things. I really don't do idiomatic phrases well. I always get them wrong. It's a source of amusement uh, with my children and my husband. Um, and I think that comes from not growing up in the culture. Um, so my barriers were language and also uh, financial. Uh, when I went to college and law school, I uh, had no money. Um, and I worked, in fact, full time my first two years of college. I went to Southern. I know, not Eastern. I wish I'd seen this beautiful building. Um, but, uh, you know, so those were my barriers, and I was fortunate to have scholarships and aid and to overcome that. So we come from very different backgrounds, and I think, you know, when I listened to Maria that I had a pretty easy time. I'm a Connecticut kid. Uh, my parents were able to afford to, s to send me to college. Um, when, when I think about barriers, I don't think so much about smashing through them, but I, I, I do think that when I became a lawyer, uh, I ended up working for some very large corporations. They were my clients. And I think they were a little aghast when they first, you know, who is this little blonde young girl who's going to represent us in multi-million dollar cases? I mean, you know, there's prejudice in that regard. And, um, you know, what I found was I just sort of kept my head down and just kept working. And um, eventually when the results were, were good, they realized that it was okay to have a young blonde girl. I mean, I, I have been referred to as that no longer, believe me, that was many years ago. But um, uh, I have heard that and I think, you know, for everybody, you just have to sort of make a decision that you're not going to listen to the nonsense and um, you're just going to work through it and through your performance demonstrate that, that you're the right person for the job. Do you believe female judges decide cases different than their male counterparts? Well, here's what I would say about that. Um, the outcome really shouldn't be different, but in terms of uh, we are people, you know, we're not potted plants and we're not machines, so we are going to come with different perspectives, and that's one of the reasons that I was saying that I think it's so important that we have a diverse bench that reflects the people that come in front of them so that they can understand their stories uh, and uh, make their best judgment based upon that. And so um, does it does it influence our perspective? Of course it does. But uh, ultimately, we're here to apply the law. So there's a real balancing there. I really, uh, I, that, I completely agree. And I couldn't articulate that uh, nearly as well as the, our Chief Justice. So I would concur. Okay. Um, without a doubt, you're familiar with the Anita Hill versus Clarence Thomas case. 
What impact do you believe this case had on America's understanding of sexual harassment? Have you seen a change in how sexual harassment is addressed? Okay, so I'll talk about that for a second because I actually, um, somewhere at Channel 12 News, there is an interview where I was interviewed. I must have been 12 and a half months pregnant. I mean, I just really was very unappealing. And um, the Anita Hill case was going on, and they had me come in and, and interviewed me about the case. So I, I am very, very familiar with the case. Um, and I believe there's an anniversary right now of the Anita Hill hearings. Um, so here's what I would say about it. Uh, prior to um, the US Supreme Court deciding, which was right near that time, 1991, that happened, uh, they decided that there could be such a cause of action under sexual uh, discrimination as um, a hostile work environment. And nobody really had given a lot of thought to that or and believe me, many of my clients, when I explained it to them, couldn't believe that that really could be a cause of action, that if, if you as a, a, a woman were subjected to um, harassment and an environment that was so belittling or discriminatory towards women that there could be um, litigation and, and you could ultimately lose. So what Anita, the Anita Hill case did was bring attention that that now was how we were going to conduct ourselves in the workplace and that it wasn't going to be allowed that you could be create in essence a you know boys will be boys and I, I apologize to the men in the room and but that really was what the Anita Hill was a case was about boys will be boys environment you couldn't just say that that you you know you had to treat everyone with respect uh, and you, there could be a situation where yes you can kid around but if you created an environment that truly made women uncomfortable uh, and believe me, I could spend days telling you about some of the cases and some of the horrible things that would happen in the workplace uh, prior to the Anita Hill situation, um, that, you know, that's no longer going to be allowed. So what it did was it brought attention to the situation. There were many, many cases filed as a result of the Anita Hill hearings. Um, I would say the good news is it's gotten significantly better. There are still pockets uh, where there are problems. I don't know if you've been following it in, in the news, the military, there's been a big problem there. Um, and that's going to get straightened out ultimately too because people are going to be used as examples who are going to lose their careers uh, as a result of what's been going on in the military. Um, but for the most part, I would say it's significantly better. And we're seeing many, many, many fewer cases than we saw in the 90s and the early 2000s um, for the same kind of uh, litigation that the Unita Hill hearings were about. I, uh, again, I, I'm not as familiar with, I'm familiar with the case, of course, but not as familiar with uh, the uh, detail. Uh, I would just add that I, in my experience, both as a superior court judge, a trial court judge, as well as previously in, in uh, my position as a federal prosecutor, we uh, had a lot of training around this issue of what is our responsibility, uh, even if not as participants, observers of uh, hostile, a hostile work environment or conduct, uh, and what do we as colleagues, as coworkers, or as supervisors have uh, in terms of an obligation. So I do think there's a lot more training um, since that case. The only thing I'd add to it is whether you believe her or not, and I'm not going to express an opinion about that, she did a lot to help bring this problem to light. Um, and uh, there has been a change in society as a result of it. What role do you play, play in protecting and advocating for rights of victims of interpersonal violence, such as sexual assault, domestic violence, and stalking? So as uh, judges, we are not advocates. Uh, we're arbiters. Uh, so our role really isn't as an advocate. However, uh, victims of, of within the, uh, the state, both the state constitution uh, as well as uh, our court rules have rights. And it is our job as judges to ensure that those rights are protected. They include the right to notice of proceedings, the right to attend, the right to be heard, uh, before a plea uh, uh, agreement is entered into, the right to be heard at sentencing. Uh, so there are certain rights, and those rights are read by trial court judges like myself every day when we open court. We advise anyone who may be in the audience there as uh, the victim of an offense of what their rights are. 
uh, when it comes to domestic violence in throughout Connecticut, we have uh, what we call the domestic violence dockets. These are dedicated dockets where uh, the same judge, the same prosecutors, the same defense attorneys, family relations officers, and other professionals all work together uh, to basically uh, attempt to eradicate domestic violence and to uh, educate uh, not just uh, the offenders but also victims. Uh, and those uh, dockets have also victim advocates. We have victim advocates in general, but we also have specifically <coughs> victim advocates assigned to domestic violence docket. But our role is, as judges, uh, my role as a trial judge is to make sure that any uh, victim uh, of a case that's before me uh, has the right to be heard, understands his or her rights, and is protected. Um, so in that sense, if you consider that advocacy, that's our role. Mm, what will be done to end human trafficking? What initiatives are currently in place to hold traffickers accountable and to protect victims? So this is an area that, um, interestingly, the federal government is very interested in, and as are the state courts. Um, and there's been quite a bit of grant money that's been going to the issue of human trafficking. And, and a lot of it is to educate both the police and the judges about what may be a human trafficking situation. So that, for instance, if there's a 16-year-old um, a a in on a prostitution charge, the judge should be able to sort of feel out, do we have a human trafficking situation here? And there are methods to doing that. And then referrals that can be made. Same thing with the police. So this is definitely, the, the, the bad news is, as we know, this is a real problem and a problem that's getting worse. The good news is that the um, justice system, uh, including both the police and the judges, are becoming sensitized to the issue so that we can help, try to help these, uh, these people. Victims of these crimes are encouraged to report their perpetrators and expect justice to prevail, holding perpetrators, perpetrators accountable. Far too often, we see the justice system fail. What advice do you have for victims of abuse? Okay, so um, you're correct that we do see failures. And I think where the failures are is regardless of what we do, and this is really important, and particularly if there's anybody, and I say this every time that I'm speaking publicly, if there's anybody in the audience who has a domestic violence problem, um, regardless of what the court system does, if somebody is intent on uh, hurting somebody else, they will find a way to do it unless you take the protective measures that, that can be available to you, and such as safe houses, et cetera. So we will get you all the legal protection but it's very important that you also make sure that you, you'll have victims advocates there, you'll have people explaining to you where the safe houses are, what you can do, particularly if you have kids, it's a very difficult situation. But all of that help is available to you and you need to really to try and use all of it um, so that you're not one of the place, people who where the system fails uh, and you ultimately do end up getting hurt. We, you know, those are the cases um, that absolutely break our hearts because we, we try to do what we can, but if somebody is intent and has a gun, there's not a whole lot we can do and is willing to violate an order. Do you believe every American has equal access to justice in today's 21st century? If so, how is this justice accessed? And if no, who has and who does not have the privilege of receiving equal access? So I think that's where we sort of started out. We're talking about where we have a concern about access. We're constantly trying to make it better. My biggest concern, just from a big picture point of view, is so many people don't have lawyers. And I think you immediately don't have equal access unless you have a lawyer. And we do, the, as I said, the best to make it an even playing field. But um, we've got to do more. You all need to, you know, some of you become lawyers and then be willing to work for legal services and things along those lines so that we do have lawyers for people who have problems in court. And I would just add that in this um, area, I, I think our Chief Justice has really taken the lead and done so much to create those opportunities uh, to have folks either with no means or modest means to have legal representation, including some really innovative programs uh, that if you haven't heard about, you will, uh, that uh, basically, uh, 
in involving both uh, the bar association, members of the private bar, corporate um, leaders uh, to both to come together and fund positions for lawyers that will represent individuals of modest means. It's similar. It was the Chief Justice's idea, and it's similar to kind of models teach across America, uh, but it's uh, called Lawyers Corp, Connecticut Lawyers Corp, uh, which is this great program. I think the first of its kind in the country, and and I just wanted to. Uh, point out that uh, that's just one of the programs that our Chief Justice has created that you should know about. Okay, so I'm embarrassed, but anyway, let me <laughs> let, let me say that um, really what's happened is the corporations in Connecticut, like United Technologies, Xerox, GE, have stepped up, and what they're going to do is fund fellowships um, for uh, people coming out of law school who want to represent the poor and those of modest means, um, and they will be paid a salary to do so and get training from the Legal Service Corporation for a two-year period. So it really, that's going to help some people, which is good. But we need a lot more. We need to do a lot more. As judges, what do you do to ensure equal access to justice? What advice do you have for future lawyers, judges, etc., to work in good effort to grant access to justice to whomever they are serving? I think you've pretty much yeah. covered that. Yeah, yeah? OK. <laughs> um, what is your legacy? You can go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you what Justice Rogers' legacy <laughs> is already, uh, and I'm sure will continue to be uh, while she is the Chief Justice. Um, I just hope my legacy is more modest. Uh, I'm a trial judge, uh, so I am the lowest level uh, court, state court judge that uh, you have. So we have trial judges, which I am, superior court judge, and then you have appellate court judges, that's the intermediate appellate court, and supreme court uh, judges. So I hope my legacy as the first Portuguese American uh, trial judge on the bench, that I uh, work as hard as I can and do the best job I possibly can to open up doors for other uh, individuals, not just of Portuguese descent, but other immigrants and other communities uh, within Connecticut, uh, so that their representatives also make it to the bench. So I hope that that would be my uh, legacy. Okay, and I'll tell you the, what Judge Khan's legacy really is, is that she's probably the hardest working judge regardless of her ethnic background. So um, that will be her legacy. You know, with mine, uh, I'm now starting my eighth year. I start this month my eighth year as Chief Justice. And really, um, what, what we've tried to do as an administration is, is instead of reacting to you know, bad things that might happen in any given courtroom on any given day, is to really be proactive about trying to make it a better system for the people who are coming into it. So that's hopefully you know, we've, we've made it a little better uh, than, what it, than what it was. What issues are important to you? How do you give back to your community? Well, so how I get give back to my community um, is I have a therapy dog. Um, I will tell you that having that dog certified as a therapy dog was much more, much more difficult than getting my law degree. It took months. Um, and she's sort of a goofy dog. You know, she barely, barely passed. I think they felt bad for me, so she passed. But. Um, it's, it's probably my favorite time of the week on Wednesday evenings. I go over and work with kids who have various disabilities. Uh, and all she does is she makes the kids laugh. And uh, that's how I don't have to do Really, I am a potted plant for the most part. But that's, I take the hour and a half to go do that. And it's really, I think it is important. And I don't need to tell you all this. But I really think it is important to find something where you, you feel better about yourself because you actually do something for somebody else. So that's what I do. I, I'm involved in a few things, uh, but I just want to highlight one thing that I do do outside, in addition to my work as a judge, is I'm a, a member of an Inns of Court, which is a group, an informal group of judges, um, senior lawyers in, in firms and, and uh, public service, and younger lawyers. And we, uh, we get together and we give a presentation. We meet seven, uh, basically during the academic year. And we have dinner, and each group puts on a presentation. And we're, it's so a judge is paired with two senior lawyers and maybe three younger attorneys. Um, and that's a great way to mentor 
young lawyers in the profession. In addition to that, I am a member and participate in the Lawyers Collaborative for Diversity. And through that program, I also mentor uh, young uh, attorneys who uh, are uh, young minority attorneys who are either in law school or about to enter law school, and I find that uh, very rewarding. I think it's really important uh, to give back in that way, particularly if you, as, as I am, uh, come from uh, you know, the background that I, that I have. Okay, so this question is kind of fun, um, maybe a little difficult. Finish this sentence. To achieve justice, you must... Be a good listener. Listen to all parties or sides, keep an open mind, and reach a decision fairly and impartially. As a judge, it is important for you to know. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> Applicable law and understand how your decisions impact all parties involved. Right. I was going to say the applicable law. So. Very few people know this, but I am really shy. <laughs> no. I am. <laughs> um, well, I was going to say most people don't. When they see me, they don't think I'm an immigrant and that I fluent in Portuguese and Spanish, uh, because they sometimes, usually, they can't notice an accent, although it's there if you look closely. <laughs> Last one. In my spare time, I. I play a lot of sports very badly, but I do play them, uh, and I like to cook. I read and I love to ski in the winter, and I love to travel when I can afford it. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. Um, I actually thought of two questions okay. <laughs> while I was sitting here. Um, so for Chief Justice, you were talking about um, sexual harassment in the military. What do you think has to be done in order to end that? Well, again, I can't really get into the politics of it, and I guess the big, but, but I can speak for a second. The, the, it's got to come from the top. The top brass has to say, we're not going to take it anymore, and we're not going to allow this to happen. And the message will come through loud and clear, um, ultimately. But they've got to change their perspective. And some of them have. I mean, there's no question. Okay. And for Judge Khan, um, I'm actually, I was born in Poland, and I came here when I was 11, oh. so I had some of the similar, I guess, issues as you did. Um, so I was just wondering, you were talking about different barriers you had, such as your parents didn't speak English. Um, so what did you do? How did you find out how to do things? Did you speak to your friends, teachers? What advice do you have for people who have similar issues? Uh, both. Uh, I, I spoke, I was really had some great teachers who told me about opportunities that I didn't even know existed throughout, including going to a magnet high school in Philadelphia that I didn't know existed, Philadelphia High School for Girls. A teacher pulled me aside, said, you ought to consider it. I was admitted on a probationary basis. I was only here three years. So my teachers, my friends, um, and you know, I have two daughters, and they're in college, and you know, they had a very different upbringing than I did. and. I often, when I was in college, I sort of thought, gee, I wish I could have the money my, my friends have or parents who are lawyers and who can guide me. Uh, but when my children don't want to listen to my advice <laughs> and they didn't have those challenges, now that I look back upon it, I'm not so sure I wasn't the lucky one because there was no pressure. Uh, anything I did was great for my parents. Um, and so now that I look back through, through their experience, I actually think that while it may be a barrier and while it may seem like an impediment, um, I was very driven and I actually think that unlike my children who, you know, have a parent uh, who, or parents who went to college and graduate school, uh, they may feel a certain pressure that I now realize I didn't have. All I had was my parents' encouragement and love. Um, I love my children, but you know. <laughs> I think, I think uh, for those of you who have parents who are professionals, I think you probably uh, feel a certain amount of pressure. Um, so, 
think it depends on the kid, right? Yeah. I have two. One who feels a certain amount of pressure and one who couldn't care less. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it was a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you for answering all of our questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.